Hey guys, welcome to another DCHL video. Today we're going to be sitting down and talking about how to play Gondor, specifically the Minas Tirith list. Now Minas Tirith is very iconic for anybody who has seen the movies. Uh, a lot of memorable scenes like Faramir's charge into his Gilead or the defense of Minas Tirith itself. Um, and it is, it is a very cool looking army. I mean, it's a very kind of uniform army. Uh, that a lot of people might find appealing. Now, that's all well and good, but how does this army actually play on the tabletop? So today we're going to be talking a little bit about how to translate your iconic Minas Tirith force from the movies to an effective force on the tabletop in the Lord of the Rings slash Hobbit SBG. Now, first of all, I think if you were to encapsulate this army into one phrase, it would be jack of all trades, master of none. This army has a lot of strengths and a lot of weaknesses, but compared to some other armies, it's never going to be the master of any one thing, but it's also never going to be weak at any one thing. So I would say that one of the biggest strengths of the Minas Tirith army list is versatility. This is an army that gives you a wide range of options that allow you to cover every possible conceivable thing you would need to do in a game of SVG. First, starting off, your basic core trooper, your warrior of Minas Tirith. Now, your warrior of Minas Tirith comes in at a very average point cost, um, just over a goblin with shield, but comes with a whole lot of options, and specifically uh, the shield and the spear, which you're going to see most often. You're almost always going to be giving these guys shields because that brings them up to a healthy defense six. Now. It's not quite dwarf defense, but defense six is going to be a very strong frontline defense for your troops that will carry you throughout a game of attrition. A lot of these you'll also see armed with spears because of the fact that they will be supporting each other. Now, one of the weaknesses of the unit is that it also has a very average fight value of three. So what you're going to want to do with these guys is, if possible, either use them to support elite troops or have them be supported by elite troops. The other core units that you're going to be looking at are, one, your Knights of Minas Tirith. Now, your Knights of Minas Tirith are, again, they're very average in most of their stats, but they do bring along that healthy defense six, and most importantly, they come with lances. Now, as we're going to get into later, one of the big weaknesses of this army can often be hitting power, and one of the units that mitigates that to some extent is your Minas Tirith lancers, which are going to get those plus one to wound rolls. For your ranged needs, your third core troop is going to be the Rangers of Gondor. Now, these sacrifice some of the strength of defense that other units in this army have, but they bring along a healthy elf shoot value of 3+, plus and a fight value of 4. They also are armed with bows and can be armed with spears. So these are the kinds of troops that make a great backline unit behind your warriors of Minas Tirith with shield, so that you have that defense 6 up front with a bow shot and a fight force spear support right behind them. Now, as I mentioned, one of the strengths was versatility, and that applies not only to a good selection of core troops, but also Gondor has access to some very interesting elite troops that come along to support the mix. The first one that you will see in probably every competitive Gondor or Minas Tirith list is going to be your Guards of the Fountain Court. These are, if you remember from the movies, these are the guys that stand around at the white tree and make sure that no harm befalls it. Uh, we don't actually see them doing anything else in the movie, but we have to assume that they are the best of the best. According to Tolkien, these are the guards of the tower. There's only three companies, and they wear the best armor and have the best weapons that Minas Tirith can offer. Now, in-game, this is reflected by a healthy defense value of six, which can be actually upgraded with a shield, making them a defense seven front line. They also come standard with spears, bodyguard, and fight four. So these are essentially your human dwarves, and they will be the bedrock of any battle line that Minas Tirith brings to the table. Supporting the Fountain Court Guard are the Citadel Guard, which are a lesser, uh, lesser company of the guards of the tower. Now these start out at a defense 5 at just over the cost of a warrior of Minas Tirith, but they bring some interesting options to the table. Specifically, this is the only unit in the Minas Tirith army list that is going to give you access to elf bows or long bows, which as we know are strength 3. Now usually this is the reserve of elves, but Gondor now has access to some higher powered shooting, and these guys also have bodyguard, so they can stay in the back and be relatively protected, not worrying about running away. Another option you have with the Citadel Guard is that you can give them a spear. Now they do have a fight value of four, so standing behind one of your warriors of Minas Tirith, they will be contributing that fight four to the fight, while the warrior of Minas Tirith will be keeping them safe with the d6. 
um, Warriors of Minas Tirith obviously only being fight three. Now one of the drawbacks is that they cannot be given shields, so they're going to stay at defense five for the game. So a common tactic you'll see with them is to give them uh, spears, longbows, or both, and put them as your support troops behind your front line. So as you can see, the Minas Tirith army list gives you a whole host of tactical options depending on how you build your army. You have a relatively, relatively strong core of D6 warriors to act as your front line, or if you want to go the elite route, the D7 fountain court guard. You have plenty of support troops, whether they be just standard warriors with spears, more slightly more elite rangers that have those bows and those spears, or something like the Citadel Guard, which, you know, as you go up, you're obviously paying more points, but they give you a wealth of options you can play with. You also have a cavalry contingent of relatively hard-hitting knights, and, uh, well, yeah, that's all that there is really to say about that. Now, if we're going to talk about versatility with Gondor, that doesn't simply end with his troop selections. Gondor also has one of the most versatile selection of heroes in the game, and heroes are really a strength of the army. They're also a bit of a weakness of the army, and we'll get to that later. For heroes, you really have three tiers of hero. First, you really truly have your upper crust. These are going to be among the best heroes in the game, and specifically, here we're talking about Boromir, Captain of the White Tower. Now, he is a healthy points investment, so you're only going to really be seeing him at higher games, but he's got it all. Fight 6, Defense 7 with a shield, which you're always going to give him unless you give him the Banner of Minas Tirith, and 6 Might, 3 Will, and 3 Fate. So as you can tell, and Strength 4, as you can tell, this is going to be the kind of hero that can swim games all on his own. With Fight 6 and 6 Might to play with and a Strength of 4, he'll be really there to lead the charge. Outside of very elite heroes and very expensive heroes like Boromir, you also have a very good selection of mid-tier heroes. And in this, I would include Faramir, who is, as we all know, uh, Boromir's brother and uh, Denethor's unwanted child. Now, in the game of SBG, he is a good, solid mid-range hero. You're, he's the kind of hero that you might want leading forces at around 500 points because he's not too expensive, but he does bring a uh, healthy 3 might, 2 will, and 2 fate. And he also has a host of options. You can run him as a ranger with just a bow. You can give him armor, a horse, a shield, a lance to run the cavalry package like we see here. So he is the kind of hero that you can tailor to the needs of the army. Along with Faramir, you also have mid-range heroes such as Syrian, which also are a very kind of captain-level points cost, but bring the three might, and some minor special rules. These aren't game-breaking heroes, but at their points cost, which is only 11 goblins with shield, you are going to get a very solid hero that can, you know, marshal your troops and lead from the front and kill basic warriors. And obviously, Gondor also has access to just regular captains, which are unremarkable like most captains. They have your standard two might, one will, one fate stat line. They're uh, not particularly courageous. They have average courage, average fight, but they do come with a base defense of six and with all the options you can give them, which include shields, horses, bows, and lances. You could get either a D7 hero that just plugs your front line, or you can use them to lead your knights and have that same hitting power with the lance. One thing Gondor has access to that many armies don't is a third subclass of heroes, which are actually incredibly cheap. These are essentially of the same point range and fighting ability of a Ranger of the North, or a Dunedain, within the 4-5 to five Goblin with Shield range, but they obviously have lowered stat lines, you know, only one might, will, and fate. But because they are so cheap, they're perfect to just be essentially a tax on getting a full warband for not very many points. Now that opens up a lot of opportunities, if you don't want to go with a hero-heavy force, to have a mass of troops without having to invest a correlate amount of points within, to, within the heroes, and allows you to have a lot more bodies on the field than some other races might be able to do. Now, that is very much a strength of the Minas Tirith army list, the wealth of different options you have both in how you set up your heroes and how you set up your warbands, but in some ways that can also be considered a weakness. So let's go on to some of the weaknesses of the army. One of the weaknesses of the army is specifically that reliance on heroes. Nothing in the Minas Tirith army list is going above a strength of three unless it is a hero, which means that your hitting power is average at best. Now, some other armies, this is not the only army that has this problem, 
Other armies offset it by having huge amounts of numbers or access to special strikes. But as you can see, with Gondor, you pretty much have just the mixture of swords, so you're not getting those piercing strikes. Uh, the army is only a fight of three overall, so even if you win those fights, you're not really guaranteed to wound anything, and that can be a huge problem. Of course, that means that your heroes are doing a lot more work than some other armies might need. So, while it's all well and good that you have a Boromir option that can go in and can really mess a lot of models up, it's also not great when those heroes happen to be black darted off the field, and then you're left with a bunch of standard troops who have trouble chipping the paint on a barnyard door. Outside of heroes, the low strength is partially offset by the fact that Minas Tirith does have access to some very high-class siege weapons, as you can see described brilliantly in another DCHL video. Uh, and specifically, we're talking about the Avenger Bolt Thrower, which does have a high strength. But again, because it costs a lot of points and it eats up three members of a warband, you're starting to spend the kind of points that you might otherwise spend on a hero to do that work on a bolt thrower that is going to get a few shots. That could pay off, it might not. Uh, so overall, the army still lacks on hitting power. Now, as I mentioned, the lances on the knights are one of the few offsets of this, and especially because your heroes, including Boromir and Faramir, can be armed with lances if they are mounted. So that is going to be something that helps you take down those tougher targets. Of course, when it comes to your Minas Tirith Lancers, at only fight three, they're going to be losing more fights than they win if they come up against either elite troops or even more elite troops that are core troopers in other armies, for example, elves or dwarves. Dwarves being the nightmare because they're both higher fight and they're usually a defense of seven, so it's very hard to crack that armor. So I would consider this one of the weaknesses that to mitigate the lack of hitting power, you're investing a lot into heroes. Or alternately, that you're investing into bringing a lot of cheap heroes to be able to uh, up your numbers, but then you're missing that hitting power because those he cheap heroes tend to be weaker overall in combat. Looking at some of those strengths and weaknesses that we just talked about, uh, strengths being versatility, a relatively easy access to a strong defense on the front line, and a good selection of heroes. Weaknesses being generally low fight among your core troopers, or average fight, better say, because a uh, fight of three is still average as opposed to, say, low. I mean, these aren't goblins. Um, an over-reliance in many cases on heroes, and general lack of hitting power. What does that lead to in terms of playstyles? Generally, I have seen most people run Gondor in one of two ways, and obviously this is to taste, tactics vary, but the two that I've seen used pretty regularly are one, what I would call swarm tactics. And this involves using, that, those, using the access to those cheap heroes, such as a Baragond, or a Damrod, or even a Denethor, to simply unlock a massive amount of troops, usually the cheaper troops, that means the warriors of Minas Tirith and the rangers, so that you have a solid front line, you have a sprinkling of bow fire and a fight four to support that line, and you might see some elites here and there to kind of plug up some of the gaps, but the point of that army is to get so many men on the table that you're generally overwhelming your opponent. Now, you're not going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the enemies biggest heroes, because most of your heroes will be weaker, but it does open up a lot of options in terms of mobility and just huge numbers of troops that you can put to good effect. Another play style that I personally prefer, and I'll go over a sample army in a second here, is to go more of the elite route. Gondor has some of the coolest elites in the game, both visually and in terms of rules. And those are the Fountain Court Guard that we talked about, the Citadel Guard, um, and uh, even though they're not technically elite, the Lancers, because cavalry are just cool. Who doesn't like a cavalry charge, you know, like you see in the movies where valiant men of Gondor are going into hopeless odds. So that play style is one that I employed recently at a DCHL event. And I'm going to show you, for example, at 800 points what an army like that looks like. To lead the army, I chose Boromir of the White Tower, and he, as we discussed, is just an all-around amazing hero. He brings a lot of might to the table, uh, he has good courage. He also, something I didn't mention, is he has the Horn of Gondor, which means that if he's outnumbered in a fight, he gets to blow this horn for free, and the one model with the highest courage that is in that fight on the opposing side 
has to take a courage test, and if it fails, he automatically wins and gets to strike. So he's very good in a fight, and if you're trying to swarm him with something like goblins and just surround him and trap him, that horn is going to mean that you're even winning fights that you probably maybe shouldn't be winning on dice or don't have to spend might to make sure you win those fights. But in this army, Boromir is the force leader, and he is leading... Um, 12 Fountain Court Guard with shields. Now these guys with their D7 and Fight 4 are an excellent front line. Supporting Boromir, I chose Baragond. He is one of those cheaper heroes that comes in at about a Ranger of the North price range. And he uh, allows me to maximize points efficiency because of the fact that Boromir eats up so many points. A cheaper hero allows me to get more troops than I might otherwise be able to do. In this case, partially for theme, because I think it looks cool and I wanted it to be a bit of a White Tower army, we chose the Citadel Guard. The Citadel Guard are armed with longbows and spears. And their role in the game is to castle behind the Fountain Court Guard and shoot off their longbows for as long as they can, because with a strength of three, their longbows, even though when you move only hit on fives with a shoot value of four, essentially if they were in a fight, you're going to want to roll a five or a six anyway to be assured that you have a good chance of winning it. So that's essentially like giving them long-range melee attacks that give a little bit of that hitting power that Gondor uh, lacks. It's also very thematic since Baragond is the captain of the Citadel Guard. And finally, for a third warband, we went with Faramir. He is on a horse, he has heavy armor, a shield, and a lance, so that he has that defense 7, and he's going to be the person that is leading a warband of 6 Minas Tirith Knights with shields. Now these guys, I have found, are a bit of a weak link in the army because of that fight 3. The rest of the army has fight 4, which mitigates some of those problems of winning fights. But the mobility and the ability to use those lances to knock out some of those heavier hitting troops has been invaluable. And the fact that you can redeploy them because of their high mobility around your relatively static battle line gives me a tactical option. So there I have good frontline defense troops, good support in shooting, and a hammer. To round it off, because the event saw many people take monsters and wizards, I chose Saruman the White. Technically, it probably should have been Gandalf if we're going to go pure theme here, I'll admit that. But Gandalf was just a little too expensive. But Saruman, what he brought to the army is he gave a little bit of that defense against things like trolls. Because this army, uh, even if they surround a troll and they lose, there's not that many men on the field, so you're not really looking to get, you know, thrown around. He allowed me access to something like a transfix, or I'm sorry, an immobilize for the good good player's case, and even a sorceress blast to uh, blast banners or shamans out of range that allowed my army to do what it wants to do, which is crash front lines and then try to win by attrition while letting the heroes like Boromir put that six might to good use to take heroic fights and just make sure to keep those models uh, dying on the opposite side. So as you can see, I've tried to put some of that versatility that Gondor has to good use by creating a ver relatively rounded force. And it did pretty well. It took second in the event, so it did pretty well. Uh, I like to think of it, minus Saruman, that it's themed around the White Tower theme and the, the Brothers Grimm, or the Brothers uh, Minas Tirith, as it were, leading it. Uh, but this is an example of an elite army that you can play for Minas Tirith that I found to be a lot of fun. All right, guys, this is Devin here, and I'm going to go ahead and pick up where Robert left off. He gave you some great advice on strengths and weaknesses of the Minas Tirith race, and also gave you some advice on how he plays the army. He's been around for a really long time and since the beginning of the game, so he's definitely shown he can absolutely play this race to perfection, and he loves it a lot. As you can see, the painted army that he had, uh, he, he definitely appreciates it and plays it quite a bit. And now, I'm going to pick up uh, where we left off on the last videos, which is how to buy the race for under $100. So first, you're going to want to pick up Damrod and Faramir. This is box comes for only $20, and it gives you two heroes right out the gate. Then you can follow up with a box of Rangers of Gondor and a box of Minas Tirith Warriors. That will give you two warbands plus the two heroes that can lead them. Then you can buy a third box just to round it out, and you can proxy one of the third box miniatures, maybe paint him a little bit different, one of the men of Gondor who have a sword raised or something like that, paint his armor a little gold or something like that, maybe a trim, and uh, you can get a third box of warriors and that will pretty much round out your force. Another option, and a uh, bit of a different twist on this, is to instead use the men of Osgiliath as captains. They look like battle-hardened warriors and they will pretty much 
fit a good captain model. They come with options that all captains could carry, even the bow. So what you do is you buy them for $15. Then go ahead and round it out once again with the Men of Gondor and the Rangers, but instead you can maybe buy Knights of Minas Tirith. You'll have all the models that you need. Maybe you can uh, get one of your spearmen for Gondor to uh, you know, clip it and get a flag on there. You know, model one on. It shouldn't be too difficult. Most people will understand you're a beginner in the game. So that will give you a total of three warbands, all being led by three different men of Osgiliath. And just so you're aware, for the other force that I had mentioned with Damrod and Farmir, there is another $20 option with, uh, I believe, Syrian is his name. Kyrian, Syrian, I'm not really sure. You guys can correct me in the comment section. Uh, I know a lot of you are Tolkien experts on that. And uh, then you also get uh, the other warrior, I believe Madril is uh, the other person who comes with him. This is also for $20. So if you don't like uh, the Faramir that you're getting and you want a shielded warrior, maybe someone who looks a little more, you know, armored up and stuff like that, Kyrian and Syrian, he will fit that role for you. So let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. This is how to play Gondor and how to buy him for 100 bucks.